Welcome to Science Never Stops with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. My name is David Weigel, and I'm the Planetarium Director at the Ndudu Planetarium. And today we're going to be uh, having a nice discussion all about uh, the sun and how it works and really how stars work in general, and hopefully answering uh, all of your questions um, that are very stellar in nature. So before we get rolling here, um, if you would like to chime in and tell me where you're viewing from, we're always interested to, to see who's watching. And um, a big shout out, I believe it's to uh, Angelina who suggested that we do this topic uh, last week. So if you have any suggestions for uh, further weeks, um, even though um, Alabama is moving towards some um, slightly relaxed um, stipulations about uh, businesses opening and that sort of thing, museums and planetariums are not yet included in that, so we are going to be uh, still closed for the uh, at least the next week or so, and uh, we'll be continuing these uh, exciting uh, presentations. So uh, with that said, we do welcome your suggestions for future presentations, and you can put those in the comments. We'd be very excited for it. Uh, so hello to Dan from Atlanta, and Carrie from Birmingham, Leanne from Arizona, Angelina, welcome back. Colin from Atlanta, good to see all of you tonight, or actually not see you at all. Good to see the sun, uh, which is never something that you should look at, of course. So uh, let's let's dive right in. And if we're if we're going to sort of ask the question of how does the sun work, um, really the broader question is how do stars work at all? Um, and that is a simple question to answer as maybe a one-liner and a very, very complicated answer if you start to answer it as more than that. So you really can just continue uh, down this rabbit hole of trying to better understand how this works. And uh, we, we are. Scientists very much are interested in how the sun works, how stars work, and uh, there's, there's a lot to understand. So let's see if I can bring my screens together to give me enough fun things. Okay, cool. So, how do stars work? Well, if we were to chop the sun in half, you would see something that uh, really doesn't look like this at all, but this is a good uh, representation. So, stars, including the sun, are in something that is called hydrostatic equilibrium. And so, what that means, let me zoom over for you bring you around. Uh, this is a uh, neat animation that we made um, for some of our planetarium presentations. So what, what we're looking at is the sun chopped in half, or really any star that's about similar to the sun, and you can see that it has a very hot core in the center, and you see these sort of red arrows pushing out and these blue arrows pulling in. So the red arrows pushing out, um, that is energy that is the result of nuclear fusion in the sun's core, and the blue arrows pulling in are, uh, that's the force of gravity. So we have radiation pressure, that force pushing out, we have gravity pulling in, because the sun has lots and lots of mass, as do all stars, and so you have this sort of um, equilibrium, this tempering, this balance between radiation pushing out and gravity pulling in. And so this is a, a very simple scenario. Uh, you have these two forces that sort of balance each other out, and you get a star, and it's very nice. Gravity pulling in allows you enough uh, pressure and temperature for nuclear fusion to occur. And with enough of this energy pushing out, then the star doesn't collapse on itself and can exist at all in the first place. So these are all uh, very good things. So here's where it gets uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, let's look at how this begins in the first place. So what I'm about to show you is one of my favorite things we put together. Um, Erin Nagelkirk made this, and uh, she's actually joining us in the comments today and can help answer your questions as well. All right, so as you have this nice molecular cloud or nebula or something, a cloud of gas and dust that is hanging out in space. And this is about to get very bright. My timing is off. 
you've got this cloud that through mutual self-gravitation starts to um, sort of collect and gravitationally clump together, that sort of thing, and starts to spin around itself and um, through the way physics works, things that are spinning like to sort of cancel out three-dimensionally and become fairly two-dimensional in this sort of disk shape. I'm going to play this again for you right in here. So through all this gravitation and uh, clumping and that sort of fun stuff, we end up with a lot more gravity as things get tighter and tighter together uh, because gravity is more effective if you're closer. So the closer things get, the more uh, quickly they spin, they are going to clump faster and faster and faster, and eventually they collapse on themselves. And once you have enough of this gravitational pressure, uh, which produces enough temperature, say 25 million degrees or so Fahrenheit, then nuclear fusion can occur. That's that really bright flash, the first uh, stellar wind uh, blowing off out into space. And hydrogen, quite literally, is uh, getting smushed together, fusing together in this enormous nuclear explosion and forms helium and lots of energy as a result. And so this is how a star is formed. You have this fusion, like we said, pushing things out and gravity pulling things in. And there's a lot of material in here. So you have lots and lots and lots of hydrogen. That's the by far the most common element in the universe. And this fuses into helium, producing helium, which is the second most common element in the universe uh, by a lot, a lot, a lot. All right, just checking the comments to make sure if you have questions, I'm answering them. No questions yet. Feel free to ask if you so desire. And so you can have a, a star that's formed here. And what you're seeing, these little um, lines sort of spinning around it, uh, you can, from the remnants of this uh, material that does not form into the star, sometimes you can get solar systems not unlike our own. Uh, but that's a conversation for another time. We don't have time to get into that so much tonight. So let's jump back to the sun. And uh, while we do so, I should also point out that the software we're using tonight is called Digistar 6 uh, from Evans and Sutherland, and that's what we use in the planetarium. Okay, so we've already chopped the sun uh, in half once, but let's do it again. Uh, and this time, this gives you um, an idea of some other things that are going on in the sun. So you've got that fusion that's, occur uh, that's occurring in the core, and the, the core of hydrogen is fusing into helium. And that is radiating away to a point, and that's what the sort of squiggly lines are uh, moving out, right? So it's radiating away, but you'll notice that it's not leaving in a straight line because light travels, uh, while light travels incredibly, incredibly quickly, uh, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Um, crazy, crazy fast. 176,000 miles per second, right? Um, even though it travels incredibly fast and to get from the core of the sun out to the surface in a straight line would take like two seconds, two to three seconds. You have this photon, this packet of light that smacks into other things in the star and gets absorbed and re-emitted and absorbed absorbed, readmitted, and so on and so on and so on. And it actually can take quite some time. Um, and textbook answers are typically, or I guess online, um, online conversations, um, articles are going to tell you it's hundreds of thousands to millions of years for light from the core to escape from the sun. And that's probably not true. It's probably closer to in the single digit thousands of years, but it's still a very, very long time. And the reason is because light doesn't travel in this nice straight path from the inside of the sun and it bounces around a lot, um, gets absorbed and re-emitted and that sort of thing. And um, yes, all sorts of crazy. Um, looking to the comments, Natalie, thank you for the request. I realize I mentioned the wrong person, so that's my mistake. I apologize. Thank you for the request. Um, Angelina wants to know, how long do we think that the sun will continue working? Um, and that's a great question that the answer to is fairly straightforward, probably another four to five billion years or so, which gives you some comfort. Um, but the process is what's more fascinating than the answer. So we've got this radiative zone that you can see sort of wiggling, wiggling out. 
and then we have this sort of circular region. This is the convective zone. So these are different means of energy transfer. So uh, radiation, right, is, is if you are um, basically getting um, ultraviolet light from the sun, for example, that can burn you. Um, it's also what you would feel when you heat up something that's um, like a, well, a radiator, for example, to um, make you warmer in your house, for example, um, or to dissipate heat away from an air conditioner or a car or something like that, it's going to um, radiate heat away from that object. Uh, convection is the sort of fluid, circular fluid energy transfer that we see in boiling water. So contrary to popular belief, um, a boiling or a pot of water will boil if you watch it, and the sun will also uh, convect if you watch it as well. But uh, if you watch it long enough, you won't know if it's convecting or not because, or you won't be able to see it because your eyes will uh, stop working very quickly. So don't do that. Um, but you have this sort of circular energy transfer where hotter plasma, which is what the sun is made of, uh, it's basically a gas that is super, super hot, and you have this sort of soup of charged particles almost. They're not uh, extremely um, attached to each other like you would see in a gas or any other state of matter. So you have this plasma that's sort of uh, cooler is going to sink down towards the interior because it's denser and material from the interior is going to get heated by this radiation and then rise to the top and then release its energy to the top and complete the cycle and it continues on and on and on and on. Lots and lots of information to tell you that the sun is pushing energy from the core out like I said at the beginning. So that's all exciting, but what happens from there? So let's take a look at something else. And I'm going to back away from the sun a little bit. Because when we look at the sun, um, this looks sort of, sort of like a hot mess. And this is not something that you can see um, with a, a telescope, um, at least not to uh, visible light. But we can see the manifestation of the sun's magnetic fields in the sort of outer surface of the sun. So while this looks like this sort of jumbled hot mess, uh, it very much is. The sun has a very strong magnetic field, uh, much, much, much stronger than the Earth. And the sun's magnetic field is what helps uh, sort of dictate the flow of plasma on the sun. And it is also what helps to um, power different uh, solar events, different solar weather. Um, and its magnetic field is very influential in um, how the sun changes and how uh, these different processes work. So basically what you're seeing is that uh, in the interior, because the sun is um, you know, an electrically conductive fluid that's rotating, this produces a magnetic field that's very strong. And it, the field is not contained within the sun, but just like the Earth, it goes uh, outside of this world, so to speak, the star, and uh, extends well out into space, um, and actually extends um, pretty much to the edge of our solar system. And the sort of influence of the sun in our solar system or is what defines our solar system, basically. So if uh, we had a model that was a little bit uh, better, we would actually be able to trace these different magnetic field lines into these weird spots we see on the sun, uh, on the so-called so surface of the sun, which is uh, the photosphere, uh, which is past the convective region. And these sunspots, these darker regions, are uh, a few, maybe a couple thousand degrees cooler than the surface temperature surrounding it, which is still quite hot. Uh, the surface of the sun is maybe 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit compared to about 25 million degrees uh, in the inside. So these sunspots are regions where the sun's magnetic field are actually uh, leaving the surface and then returning into the surface. And the reason they're darker is because this convective process is slowed down by magnetic field lines due to how plasma works uh, with magnetic fields. So basically, you can't have convection occurring uh, as nicely and so it cools down these areas because it can't happen. 
Okay, so uh, Molly wants to know, can convection happen without the magnetic fields in the first place? Uh, yes, convection can occur without a magnetic field, um, but the moving of plasma, not necessarily due to convection, but the moving of the plasma is what produces the magnetic field in the first place. So you really wouldn't have um, convection of a plasma without um, magnetic fields, even though they're not um, directly correlated, if that makes sense in a, in a bad answer sort of way. All right, so this is already much more complicated than I intended this to be. So let me put this on pause for a moment. Let me turn that off and let me bring up uh, a different view. And I want to show you uh, a neat picture which is the highest resolution uh, picture that we have seen uh, of the surface of the sun, uh, of the surface of the sun uh, to date. And this was released uh, maybe a couple weeks ago or so, um, even maybe less than that. And what we're seeing is the result of imagery from a sounding rocket that was la uh, launched from uh, White Sands in New Mexico. And we are particularly interested in this sort of um, coronal loop that we're seeing in here. So in that square that we can see right here, um, we are looking very closely at the effect of the sun's magnetic field influencing how plasma is streaming away from the surface of the sun in unprecedented detail. And when we look at this sort of uh, zoomed in view of this, the very small filament-like features that we're seeing in here are on the order of maybe 150 mile, or 125 miles uh, in width. So that's very, very, very fine, uh, fine features that we can see on the sun. And again, much, much better than we've ever been able to see before. So you have this magnetic field that is leaving through a sunspot, returning through a sunspot, and the plasma is traveling along these magnetic field lines and producing these spectacular loops and can also cause all sorts of uh, violent events on the surface of the sun. So uh, when we talk about violent events, um, you can think of things like um, a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection. And uh, let me show you what those look like. So let me get rid of that. And Let's take a look at the surface of the sun. So using uh, different telescopes, um, this one is called the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's um, in space and known as SDO. And it is able to look in uh, extreme ultraviolet light into X-ray. Uh, you can see the wavelengths in angstroms down here. And what we're doing is we're looping over about a three-day period. It's uh, July 22nd through 24th in 2012. Um, the reason we're going so far back is because the sun is pretty calm um, at this point in time and goes through this about 11-year solar cycle, and we're in the calm part, not the active part. So the sun is quite boring looking at the moment. Um, so uh, what we're seeing is the surface of the sun, and you can see some, spot, some sunspots off to the left. Um, you can see this sort of patch in here, but I want you to pay attention right here and right in here and right in here and see how when we bring up different uh, wavelengths of the sun, then we can see different features as well. So I'm going to sort of step my way uh, further and further away from the surface of the sun. Now we're looking at the sort of upper photosphere coming into view here. So very similar, but a, a, touch, a touch higher. Let's go... Uh, one more still into the chromosphere, which is basically like the um, sort of lower atmosphere of the sun. Keeping in mind that when I say the surface, the sun is full of plasma. It's a big ball of plasma, and there's not a surface, so to speak, that's solid that you could stand on, but um, sort of the where effective density um, drops if you go farther away. So now we can see off to that side really, really prominent um, 
nice features, and this is a much more exciting view of the sun than we had before. So we've got these, these coronal loops, we've got some prominences, these sort of coronal streamers where the magnetic field um, is allowing plasma to stream away from the sun out into space. Uh, very, very dynamic, very, very beautiful. So the question is, um, I guess, what is a solar flare and can it hurt us? Uh, let me play this one one more time. Uh, what is a solar flare and can it hurt us? Um, a solar flare is an explosion on the surface of the sun. Uh, it can be for a variety of different reasons. It can be where magnetic field lines sort of cross and that releases a tremendous amount of energy localized. Very, very powerful. And the result of solar flare um, is a tremendous amount of release of energy. And if that hits the Earth, uh, that can uh, be detrimental in terms of some increased radiation risk by a little bit. Um, but um, the ability to black out um, communication satellites, um, that sort of thing. But not, not to a significant degree because flares are quite localized and you can think of it sort of like a tornado um, as a bad analogy. If we step our way up uh, a little bit further where we're going to the edge of the chromosphere almost into the corona, this looks uh, even more pretty still in my opinion. Uh, really prominent features, and you can see that there's some sort of releases on the left limb, and these are small coronal mass ejections. So a coronal mass ejection is more like a hurricane if a solar flare is like a tornado. It's where uh, a big chunk of plasma is detached, encapsulated by a magnetic field, and gets flung away from uh, the sort of surface of the sun, and out into space, and that's quite dangerous for the Earth when that happens, and it's directed towards us because it's a tremendous amount of very, very energized particles, and that is uh, worse for things like communications, blackouts, um, and can even be detrimental to the power grid if we're not um, well prepared, or if you live in a region where the sort of ground is very uh, conductive. So you can actually basically fry all your power lines and your power plants and that sort of thing because these very strong um, electrical currents are generated in our upper atmosphere. And you'll get amazing aurora, the northern lights, but you also might get uh, some mess with you. So that's, that's tough. Uh, let's see. So Dan Moffat asks, how dense is the sun's surface? And I don't know. Aaron, that might be um, something to look up. I'm not sure. Good question. Uh, also, I missed one from uh, Dustin. Do you think that you will continue these live streams after everything returns to normal? That is a great question that I don't have an answer to uh, you about, and that really depends on my boss, I guess. So you can you can take it up with them. Um, but I'm having a great time doing these, and I I hope you are enjoying them as well. Stepping further. We're going to jump one more up. Our features are starting to get a little bit softer uh, simply because the light, the wavelengths that we're looking at are uh, a little bit harder to see and the, the features are a little bit, um, I guess, uh, harder to pull out in these wavelengths. Uh, stepping further still. Uh, I should also point out that none of these colors uh, are actually corresponding to what we're seeing. They're all false color just so that you see that there's a difference in the wavelengths that we're, we're using. So, so again, for structure of the sun, we've got the core at the center. We have the radiative region, the convective region. Then we get to the surface, which is the photosphere. We get to the sort of outer atmosphere, or sort of inner atmosphere that's the, the chromosphere. And then we get into what's called the solar corona. And the corona is this region that is incredibly, incredibly tenuous and incredibly, incredibly hot. Incredibly, incredibly hot. Oh, I like this one a lot. So, and this is, this is a nice view of uh, the corona in here and features very far away. So the corona is something that you can view in a total solar eclipse. Um, hopefully you saw the last one in the United States, and if you didn't, there's one um, in April of 2024, so put that on your calendars. April 11th or 12th, it's a, it's a Monday, something like that. Skip work, it will absolutely be worth it. Um, either way, uh, you can actually see this, this very, very um, faint region when 
the sun is eclipsed, and you can see all these uh, sort of plasma streaming away uh, following these magnetic field lines that go far out into space. And the corona is not very bright, but it's incredibly, incredibly hot, way hotter than makes sense. So let's jump back, uh, look at the sun again. And uh, when we look at the sun, if we step from 25 million degrees in the core and get cooler and cooler and cooler until we're about 10,000 degrees at the surface, and then we step up maybe, I don't know, 25,000 degrees into the chromosphere, um, and then we jump up to about 2 million degrees in the corona. That doesn't really make any sense at all. It would be as if you were at a campfire, and the farther away you got, you got hotter. That is very counterintuitive. So the question is, why is that the case? Why is the corona hotter than the surface? And the answer is, I don't know, and no one else knows either. And if you answer that question, you might get a Nobel Prize, because that is really uh, a very um, prominent question in solar physics. The question, perhaps, in solar physics is, why, why is the corona so hot, and what is going on there? And I don't know. Um, the Parker Solar Probe is uh, currently orbiting the sun, and it's the closest we've ever um, journeyed to the sun about 4 million miles away at the closest approach, which is actually very, very close for the sun. And it is giving us much better understanding of the sun and hopefully can give us some better understanding as to how the corona works and how it gets heated uh, to these crazy, crazy temperatures. All right, so... Continuing on, right now we're looking at sort of a, a, an eclipsed view of the sun by a satellite called SOHO, another space telescope, and you can see where the sun is in that sort of a white circle, and you can see the stellar wind streaming away along these magnetic field lines, that's what all of this is in here, and then you see these coronal mass ejections, one, two, um, another one right here, kind of slow, you can see them billowing out into space, and all this uh, sort of energetic material flying by. That's probably Mercury or a comet or something like that. Um, these little dots. And then all of this, uh, this little snow almost, uh, this is the sensor getting bombarded by enhanced radiation from uh, these explosions. So it gives you an idea of how it's uh, very, very energetic particles are sort of overloading the camera. And then we'll step away one more further. Uh, this is another view from SOHO, puts you even farther away, and hopefully gives you a sense of these features even further. So you can see more coronal mass ejections, also known as a CME, billowing out into space. All very cool. Okay, so, are you still with me? Hopefully. A lot going on in here. Uh, last thing I want to show you with regard to the sun, and we'll talk about how it's going to die, um, let me give you a quick video of the other extremely high resolution thing we have of the sun as of very recently, uh, December of this last year, which is from the DKIST uh, telescope, which is actually ground-based, and this is the sort of convective cells that we see, the granulation on the surface of the sun on the photosphere. So you can see that they look like they're boiling, and that's essentially what's happening. Um, to give you a sense of perspective, this uh, each one of those cells is maybe about the size of Texas or so. And this is maybe, yeah, I would say, I would say they're, those are all about the size of, of Texas or so, perhaps a little bit smaller in some cases. Uh, perhaps bigger in some cases, and yes, looks kind of like popcorn. Uh, we put this on the planetarium dome, uh, very big, and it was uh, cool, but also a little bit overwhelming, and you felt like you were in our popper. All right, so I guess the question follows, how is the sun going to uh, die? We talked about, um, answering a question, we talked about how 
things were going to, uh, the sun would stop shining after, you know, maybe four billion years or so, but then, then what, right? So if we uh, zoom into the sun, let's try this one more time. Uh, if we zoom back into the sun, get close, what you'll see is that as the fuel of the sun, there we go. Okay, I was way too close. Uh, as the fuel of the sun uh, starts to diminish, hydrogen is fusing very, very quickly into helium. Eventually, you do run out of hydrogen, and you get too much helium. Helium takes a lot more energy to fuse than hydrogen, and a star about the size of the sun isn't going to have enough energy to fuse much, if any, helium. So the result of that is eventually you start to fizzle out, um, but you do start to heat up uh, as you burn more and more and more fuel the longer you've been alive. And eventually you can't radiate that temperature or that, that energy away uh, efficiently and quickly. And so the only way to get rid of this energy enough uh, is to basically expand the star and sort of uh, the result of this expansion means that the density decreases substantially and you sort of have this weird pulsing uh, scenario where large quantities of the stellar material are blown out into space in a sort of pulsating fashion, and you get a red giant that is uh, absolutely enormous. So if we were to turn on uh, planetary orbits, for example, you can see that uh, Earth's orbit is basically inside of the sun uh, at this point, or at least very close. And this is what we're looking forward to, you know, in maybe uh, three billion years or so. So probably don't stick around uh, that long find somewhere new to live. So um, after this happens, eventually you just run out of fuel as a sun-sized star, and you sort of fizzle out and become what's known as a white dwarf, where it's basically just helium that's very, very hot and radiating. And that's the extent, a sort of smoldering ball of helium. Um, not so fun. Let's say it's a much bigger star. And again, this is not the sun, a much, much bigger star instead. What might happen? Well, you might get something along these lines. Um, helium in a bigger star can fuse into heavier things like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and uh, silicon and so on and so on until we get to iron. And as soon as iron is trying to be fused, it actually requires more energy to fuse than it emits. And so the star becomes unstable like instantaneously. And the result of this instability, I'm going to play that one more time for you. The result of this instability uh, is that the core collapses on itself. You don't have enough radiation pressure pushing out. Gravity is, on this very massive star, is pulling in very tightly. And so you get uh, sort of core degeneracy where your protons and electrons are quite literally smushed together and become neutrons. And so you don't have fusion occurring anymore in a matter of like a second or so, the star collapses and the release of energy when these neutrons are formed is so tremendous that the star spews its guts all over surrounding space in catastrophic fashion and produces a nebula. Um, but if the core collapses on itself entirely, then it produces a black hole. If not, it's a neutron star, uh, but if it collapses on itself entirely, then you're left with a black hole like you're seeing in here. And that's very exciting and also terrible if you're anywhere nearby. Uh, the black hole won't get you um, first. The supernova definitely will. Um, so, so that's rough, uh, I guess is what I'm saying. If you live near a star that's, that is this big, but you don't. So all, all good on that front. So I guess to conclude, the sun is fairly boring. And the reason I say that is not just because it's a very average star. Um, it's actually very, very inactive compared to a lot of other stars recently surveyed um, that are similar in size to it. And that's actually quite beneficial for you and I because less active means a lot less uh, radiation and opportunities for us to get fried by uh, stellar activities. And that's not the sort of thing that we want to have happen. So. Um, so that's good. That's good for us. It's also boring because the sun is something that 
is very um, lonely in the solar system. I mean, yes, we're here, but there are no other stars here. And for example, we could go elsewhere in, in uh, our galaxy. Oh, and flying through the sun, that's always painful. My apologies. Again, a reminder never to look at the sun, uh, even though we just did for the last 35 minutes. But uh, as we're hurtling through space here, we're actually heading towards a group of stars called, um, this is the Castor system. It's um, one of the stars in the constellation Gemini. And when I say one of the stars, it's actually more. If we turn on orbit lines, you'll see that here we have, this is Castor, oh, on the wrong page. This is Castor A, and this is Castor a, B. So this is A, capital A, lowercase a, and capital A, lowercase b, and they're sort of orbiting a shared center of mass, which is right about in here. If we back up further, you'll notice, hey, guess what? We have another pair in here. We could fly to it, but um, you can just believe me that there's caster B, A, and B, B, and they're a binary pair right here. And together, these two binary pairs are orbiting this shared center of mass right in here. If we zoom away, you'll notice there's a third star, or rather a third pair of stars. This is Castor CA and CB. And they're orbiting each other, and they're orbiting the uh, sort of sextuplet that is these two binary pairs plus this one all around this shared center of mass, which is right there. So this is a six star system, which is crazy, a lot more wild uh, perhaps than uh, some things that uh, we might be seeing in our solar system uh, or in most other places. But the majority of stars that we can see uh, in the night sky are actually multi-star systems. And so we are a bit in the minority in that we just have one and the sun is sort of boring uh, in the first place anyway with its sort of lack of uh, activity going on compared to other stars. And it's not going to blow up. So it seems like a bad thing to leave you with. But it's great because uh, the sun provides us all sorts of light and energy and it's not too big and not too small. It's not too hot and not too cold, not too bright, not too dim. And that allows us to live very pleasant lives here on the earth. And if we were elsewhere in the solar system, we wouldn't. And if we were elsewhere in the Milky Way, we might not either. So these are all very positive things. Okay, so last question before we leave. Uh, Jibril asks, what if, per se, the Earth was to survive the Sun's red giant stage, what would happen with the Earth when the Sun is a white dwarf? Uh, so to preface this, we wouldn't survive the red giant stage in nice fashion because that sort of unsheathing of the outer atmosphere is very detrimental to anything around. Lots of radiation, lots of plasma, lots of not good. That would, that would cook the Earth. Um, but if somehow we shielded ourselves in some fashion that is not existing today, we have three billion years or so to figure that out, um, what would happen? The sun would be very, very, very dim. The heat would be very, very, very minimal compared to what we have today. And it, it would start better and then get worse as we go. Um, it's not a good scenario. You would need a lot of, a lot of life support. So, so I don't have a good answer for you as to what would happen, but it's not a good answer. Um, if I gave you a better answer, if that makes sense. Cool. Well, oh, and then one last thing to clarify, uh, Colin wants to know, why does the star collapsing only occur on much larger stars than our sun? Um, I, if I didn't mention, it's because the mass of these stars is so great that the cores can get to much higher temperatures. So when you get to higher temperatures, you can fuse heavier and heavier and heavier things. Um, and this allows for other things to happen, and also explosions. So, cool. If I missed any of your questions, uh, I'll go back and answer them in the chat afterward, but thank you for joining me. Uh, remember that science never stops, not here at the Space and Rocket Center, nor anywhere. And my name is David Weigel, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day or evening or whatever it is where you're watching. Thank you. Take care.